Welcome to Business at the Speed of Coffee, the one show about business, for business, by business. Throughout this year on our show, we've had many outstanding New Zealanders who've been thought-provoking and whose backstories has contributed to the civil and national dialogue. Today I have with me one such individual, and he indeed will end our season today. He's none other than Sir Jim McClay. And as long as anyone can remember, he has been somewhere in our public discourse, from lawyer, politician, ambassador, banker, and most recently, something of an historian. Let me introduce you to Sir Jim McClay. Welcome to Business Beat as I Jim. Thank you, Kim. Now, Jim, uh, to most New Zealanders, you don't need a lot of introduction, but I don't know how much they know about where you really started. Are you from Auckland? Where, where did you grow up? I was born in Auckland, born in Devonport. Uh, so I'm an Aucklander and a New Zealander through and through. Where did you go to school? I went to school first in St. Helier's School, one of yeah. the oldest schools yeah. in the Auckland area, over 150 years old now. Uh, and um, then I went to King's School and then King's College and then Auckland University. Were you a good student? No. Uh, a, a middling student, I think, would be the best way to describe it. So you weren't the ducks or anything like that? Or nothing like that, no. In those early days, did you have an interest in public policy? Yes, I probably did. Um, I, uh, I recall very early on, and this is public policy in the wider geopolitical yeah. sense, hearing a BBC news broadcast about the dispute between Jordan and Israel over the waters of the, of the uh, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and and b because the names were familiar from biblical yeah. terminology, yeah. Uh, I took an interest in that and tried to find out why they couldn't share the water. Well, yeah. uh, 50 plus years later, we... We know why they yeah. can't share. And you the spent water. some time there, of course. I have indeed, yeah. yes. But but uh, the, the same applied to to local policy. I can remember taking an interest in in political issues of, the, of a domestic nature. As well. It would be fair to say you grew up what by New Zealand standards would be perhaps considered a privileged upbringing. But you've been very much a man of the people since then. I, I wouldn't call it privilege. I would say it's very it was very middle class, middle middle income, <laughs> middle everything. I was, I guess, in terms of upbringing, very much a middle New Zealander. So at some stage, you must have developed an interest in, in law. How did that happen? A bit of a mistake in some ways. <laughs> uh, not that I regretted it, yeah. but I, I, I had, a, had a vision or an image of the law as being a place where you know, people, lawyers got up in front of judges and, mm. and juries and argued their cases. Uh, and, of course, I assumed that that was the way the law was practised. Mm. And because I had the bit of the gift of the gab, I thought, well, that, that's for me, and uh, that's how I became uh, first a law student and then a lawyer. Uh, but in fact, I didn't practice law very long. Oh, okay. uh, in total years in the law, about 12. Yeah, but at some stage you became Attorney General or something similar, if I recall. But that's a bit going ahead of us. So you're in the law. It, there must have been some road to Damascus moment or rush of blood to the head that got you into politics, surely. <laughs> A group of us at Auckland University were involved with the National Party. Uh, it was like called Young the, Nats type thing. Uh, yeah. Yes, but not Young Nats. It yeah. was separate. It was uh, a, the Auckland University National Club. Yeah. There was an equivalent version, the Princess Street yeah. branch of the Labour Party, and there were smaller political yeah. groups uh, as well, conservatives and uh, socialists. So it's interesting at this early stage, you're already, let's say, on the conservative side of, of, of politics. Yes, I, I, and that's where I have always been, centre-right. Not extreme right. Just was there any ex right. personal experience that, that, that got you there? or No, uh, no particular personal experience. I, I read a lot yes. and I was impressed with what I read and particularly on the centre-right part of the spectrum mm -hmm. uh, and was drawn to the logic of, uh, of the centre-right side of politics. Your first electorate was Northcote, is that right? Yeah, no, now called Northcote, it yeah. was then called Birkenhead. Yeah. And, uh, Without doing um, all the incredible experience you had in politics, you were uh, in the cabinet of the late Sir Robert Muldoon. Would you like to give us some sense of what that was like? Because, I mean, these days it keeps coming up, that period of New Zealand's history. Usually by people who know nothing about it <laughs> yeah. and wouldn't have known Muldoon if they bumped into him in the street. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, right. that's, that's the reality. And, but they make all sorts of assumptions about the man. First of all, on one, in, on one side of the equation, he was brilliant. He was a very effective public speaker, didn't use long words or no. complicated language. Uh, you will find very few of his speeches with words uh, with more than two syllables, yeah. just as an example. Uh, and, a, and an expert communicator, a 
a very fine comedian's sense of timing. Yes. He could deliver a straight line, absolutely straight line, and get a laugh simply by the pauses. Uh, and that, that too was uh, very engaging for audiences. Uh, and he absorbed information uh, at an incredible rate and on an incredible scale. Using the scale. modern pejorative term, was he something of a control freak? No, well, not, not, not at least as far as my portfolios were concerned. He never interfered. Is that right? Occasionally I would report to him. And you won't find many examples of him doing it, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. That the, this is one of the many myths that have developed about the man. On the, on the minus side, he was a bully. Mm -hmm. uh, not the first politician uh, be so, yeah. to, to be so described. He um, came to believe, particularly as the years went by, that effectively he could make economic water run uphill, <laughs> uh, that he could uh, lower the rate of inflation mm -hmm. at a time of international inflationary mm -hmm. pressures, and that he could um, uh, better his fellow man by decree. Mm -hmm. And uh, that proved ultimately to be his political and policy downfall. So towards the end of his t tenure, uh, it became obvious that that wasn't going to work. You stepped in at that stage, didn't you? I did, but only on a very limited basis, mm -hmm. an important basis. But after we lost the 1984 election, there was that interreg interregnum of yeah. about 10 days when the final uh, votes are counted and the results are declared. Mm. Uh, Labour wanted to devalue, I'm, I'm summarising this, yeah, yeah. wanted to, to devalue the New Zealand dollar on the advice of the Treasury. There was a, an economic crisis. There was even a threat that we might default on our loan yeah. obligations, and that would have enormously serious... Younger New Zealanders forget that New Zealand was a terrible peril then. Uh, 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 only briefly, but, yes. but it was in, in real peril. Um, Muldoon effectively refused uh, to uh, devalue while he was Minister of Finance, yes. and he was still Minister of Finance until the following week. Mm. Uh, I had to go to him and say that we'd lost the election, that there was a constitutional convention, that if, um, if the incoming government wanted something done urgently, we would have to do it as a caretaker. Uh, and uh, they, the, the Labor yeah. government would be accountable for what was done, yeah. but we were the agents, effectively, of, uh, of, of, the new yeah, of yeah. caretakers for the new government, uh, and that we had to comply. Uh, and very, very reluctantly, and after a very unpleasant confrontation mm. for which he never, yeah. for, never forgave me, no, that's right. um, <laughs> the, uh, he agreed to do it. Uh, and now that constitutional convention, as I described it, is enshrined in our law, in the Cabinet Manual, uh, and indeed in the Cabinet Manuals of uh, several other um, Westminster-style democracies as well. So you made history. <laughs> yeah. Away. And, it was um, and it was a bluff. <laughs> it, it, was, was it? it was a bluff. There was no established constitutional convention other than common sense. But it had to happen. It so had to happen. Yeah. And my only defence is the streaker's defence. Yeah. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yes, well, it was. Uh, from then into banking, is that right? Yes. Well, I, I stayed in Parliament for another two and a half, three years. Yeah. Uh, and then I retired at the 1987 election. And you're correct, I finished up uh, as an investment banker. Now, so moving out of politics and somewhat to the law into, now, into commerce, uh, and I know you've been on many boards, um, did you find that, a lot of politicians find that transition quite difficult, but it seemed to be a very natural for you. It, 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 I found it enjoyable. Uh, I like a governance role, which yes. is what we're talking about. Um, I uh, got a, a very favourable review, or got favourable reviews mm. from many commentators. Brian Gaynor, for, yeah. for example, uh, held up my um, directorships mm. as an example of how a former politician can adapt to the world of commerce. One of the things I recall, and it was a moment that I'll never forget, uh, where your political activism had a real impact on the world, is when you were commissioned for Wales. Can you tell us a little bit about experience and, and, and the time when the Japanese were busy with their commercial whaling? Because I, I know we all have you to thank for the progress we've made in that regard. Oh, a lot of other people besides, including NGOs. And that was an interesting thing, simply because it was an opportunity not just to work with governments to yeah. governments, but also with NGOs. Mm. Uh, uh, NGOs that probably I wouldn't have had much contact with, were <laughs> yeah. it not for yeah. the Whaling Commission. Greenpeace, WWF. Uh, Can you describe to us what the Whaling Commission was? Because a lot of people may not know. It was established under a 1946 convention for the regulation of, of, of whaling. Uh, 
Uh, it at the time whaling was a was a respectable and widely uh, followed industry. Mm. It was particularly popular in Japan after mm. the Second World War because they lacked protein mm. from any other sources uh, and were in, in grave difficulties following the defeat. Um, it, it, over the years, because it was for regulation of, wha of whaling, which could include non-whaling, yeah. uh, over the years uh, the sentiment moved away from commercial whaling for all sorts of reasons. It was very obvious that whale numbers were deteriorating very rapidly uh, and wouldn't be uh, survive, wouldn't survive, couldn't be sustained at the present rate of uh, whaling activity. Mm -hmm. The permits that were issued by the various by the whaling commission to the various whaling countries uh, were basically politically negotiated. So they're unsustainable. They were one unsustainable, and they weren't based on science. Okay. Uh, so uh, it, it was pretty obvious that particularly some of the larger species, blue whales, for instance, were hunted almost to this. And they would be disappearing if something wasn't done. Yes. So how did you get the consensus? I remember that wonderful moment on television. We were all standing around at the UN or wherever it was, holding hands. Uh, it was very moving for me because I'm, you know, I'm a lover of whales. So, and presumably, many other people are too. Uh, I guess back up a bit. Had you had a, a particular interest in, in whales? Or? Always had an interest in, in in whales. But it wasn't but a lifelong passion. Really. Not 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 a great passion. When, when the Japanese Prime Minister came to New Zealand in I think 1985, and I had the usual leader of the opposition meeting with yeah. him, uh, that was the issue I raised because it was right at the time when the international community was debating uh, a possible global moratorium on commercial whaling. Yeah. In other words, a zero quota for all countries. And of course, the Japanese were not have anything to do they, with that. They didn't want uh, to do And the Norwegians uh, as well. The, 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 the politics and the, the legalities of the, of the two approaches by yeah. Japan and Norway were quite different. Uh, Japan okay. uh, eventually acceded to the uh, global moratorium under, I'm sure, US pressure. Yeah. And but and then immediately set about uh, calling it scientific calling whaling. calling it scientific whaling, uh, and killing um, eventually over a thousand whales, m many of them minke, many of them in the Southern mm. Ocean, which is our area of particular interest. Now, with the benefit of nearly twenty years of hindsight, um, how do you feel about the work you did then? Was it successful? It, did you feel good about it, that? It, it was largely successful. I wouldn't say it mm. was a hundred percent successful because whaling still does go on, yeah. but it is much more limited. And many species are less. coming back, of course. Yes, but not not quickly. I mean, these are large mammals. Yeah. Uh, they have long breeding cycles. Long breeding cycles. They don't recover. And they're quickly. threatened by other things as well. Of Indeed. Course. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, if you uh, try to photo identify a whale, the easiest way is to, uh, like a fingerprint, is to uh, photograph and then compare the um, the shark bites on their dorsal fin. Because oh, okay. <laughs> they've got predation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a very large uh, amount yeah. of predation. I, I, I would have to say that the public relations battle is fought. I, mean, I don't think anyone that I've ever met doesn't think we should be saving whales. I mean, uh, uh, unless there are some out there they're in Japan. You're probably not meeting many people in Japan. No. <laughs> or, or, been, or Norway. Norway, yeah. They, yeah. And, and I have sympathy for the Inuit, of course, who've hunted them. To, to live on for we years, have but, a, but they we have take a very small numbers. We have a, a category called Aboriginal subsistence yes. whaling, and uh, that's how you deal with it. But, that. I mean, I've been up there. They don't uh, affect the, the, the survivability. One or not. two. Uh, and they eat what they kill. I don't have a problem with, with that at all. Um, so that would have been an interesting international experience, maybe a precursor to your work as an ambassador. Well, I, was on the I was on the commission for 10 years. Yeah, well, and you made a big contribution, clearly. Did you feel that was a good training ground for the subsequent work as ambassador to the UN? I didn't see it as a tra training ground when I was there. No. Uh, I was um, uh, interested in the task yeah. I was doing. I saw it as an end in itself. And it was ooh, four or five years after I'd left the commission mm. when Murray McCulley uh, asked me if I'd be prepared to go to New York as our ambassador to the United Nations. Can you tell us a bit about what went through your mind when you suddenly contemplated what you were going to have to try and do there? At the UN? Yeah. Yes, uh, it was an incomplete uh, assessment of what would be involved. I knew, for example, that we were a candidate for a seat on yeah. the uh, Security Council, which initially would have been after I had left New York. Yeah. Eventually, the government asked me to stay until after we had been elected yeah. to, and indeed it started serving on the council. Um, 
Uh, and that was clearly going to be a major exercise, even though at that stage it, it wasn't contested. There were two, two countries, yeah. New Zealand and Spain, seeking two seats. And uh, you, you can't be declared elected unopposed. You've still got to get a two-thirds majority of those voting, even in an uncontested okay. race. But So the you, task for you was to, to get, get the seat. votes. Get the votes. Yeah, that, that was, that was my, a, my task wasn't to get, well, get yeah. the seat, it was to get the votes <laughs> yeah. uh, and then yeah. get the seat. Yeah. Now, the UN, of course, has been often criticised for being ineffectual, bureaucratic, uh, corrupt, uh, all those things, and the US now you know, has always undermined it to some extent by not paying it. Were those things evident when you got there? Well, first of all, let, let, let's be quite clear. Yeah. The United Nations was established in 1945 mm. after the most destructive war in human history. Mm. Everybody <clears> wanted <throat> peace. Uh, everybody knew that it wasn't going to be easy to deal with problems like depression, which had eventually resulted yeah. in war, and then total war, mm -hmm. so massive global depression, total war. It wasn't going to be easy to de deal with those problems by other more peaceful means. Yeah. There would be failures. Yeah. There would be occasions when it wouldn't work. But as Winston Churchill once said, jaw jaw is better than war war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, and that's... And that's continues to this day. But uh, I think people had maybe unrealistic expectations of what would be achieved at the UN. But well, there were those yeah. starry-eyed people who yeah. thought that there was a world government and all that sort of nonsense. Yeah. Never was, never was going to be. So in the context, as you've just put it, you, you would have to then argue that what the UN does today is more or less what it's able to do and, and satisfactory. Look, there are 14 peacekeeping operations right now involving over 100,000 personnel Really? Keeping, keeping I mean, the peace, uh, separating uh, opposing forces, disarming soldiers, re-establishing the rule of law and governance and all those things, um, coming in to do economic development, the development program that yeah. Ellen Clark ran, yeah. for example. Uh, and refugees. Re refugees, demining. We, I think the UN spends about $150 million a year on demining. Uh, and every in time West I'm, Africa and places like well, that, yeah. no, Cambodia, yeah. um, uh, uh, Palestine. Yeah. I mean, there are mines in Palestine that were laid by the Jordanian army in 1948, at the, at the time of the original uh, original um, uh, conflict between the Israel and the Arab states. Now, every time I met with the demining people, yeah. I, I always came away with the feeling, well, that's $150 million well spent. Mm -hmm. People aren't being delimbed and everything else the awful that happens when you step on a landmine. And of course these stories don't get told very often, I mean. No, the UN is only as good or as bad, usually as bad, as its last headline. Yeah. UN fails to agree on Syria. Yeah. UN fails to agree on Yemen. Those mm. sort of headlines. They expect the UN to be able to wave a wand and, and, and stop all war, but it's not going to happen. So as you, uh, uh, what were your sort of impressions as you arrived at the, at the General Assembly? Was it overwhelming? Not overwhelming, but somewhat awestruck when the first time you get up to speak in the General Assembly mm. um, chamber, the same place where Khrushchev banged his shoe on the table, oh, really? things, things like that. <laughs> and then you go to the, the, the Security Council and you have the confront. You, you sort of shut your eyes for a moment and you have the confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union over the Cuban Missile Crisis. In those rooms? And, and you sit and think, my God, here's a boy from St. Helier's and... Look, yeah. look where he is. And history been, has been made here. Yeah, history um, is, is and continues to be made. And in terms of New Zealand being a very small player in this very large theatre, did you get a sense that people are dismissive of us or what, what sort of... No, actually New Zealand's reputation is a very good one at the United Nations. We, we're, not a, we're not a member of the G8, we're not a member of or the G7 or G8, we're not a member of the G20, we're not a member of the NAM or the EU or NATO or anything such as that. We're like-minded with them on a lot yeah. of issues. But we're not G anything. We are, a, we have, and we pursue a very independent foreign policy, largely agreed between the two yeah, major yeah. parties, which is a good thing. So there's continuity, mm. uh, and overall, New Zealand's reputation at the UN is very strong. I remember once uh, talking with a Caribbean ambassador who wanted me to try and get on the agenda of a small arms m uh, meeting that mm. I was to chair tried to get something on the agenda. It was actually trade. Yeah. Uh, and I said to him, look, we'll spend five days just arguing about the agenda if we get, get in that. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he said, come on, you can do it. You're the, you are the bridge builders. So there's a reputation of pr pr yep. 
and, and I thought, Came my gosh, I, maybe we are the bridge builders. Um, in, you know, things change all the time, but it, since, yeah, but certainly as you were there leaving, we had a change of government in the United States with, with Donald Trump coming into the White House and all the ruckus that the, the Brexit is happening. Did you get a sense of foreboding about all this? Or, or does the business of the UN just go on in spite of... The well, well it, it does go on because it has to go yeah, on. Yeah. But, but the reality is that the world has always faced things like Brexit yeah. and its implications or changes of policy uh, in the United yeah. States, uh, as we've seen on some issues. Uh, and, and you work around those. I mean, the, the, the world scene, the geopolitical scene is not static. It doesn't yeah. just sit there and wait for you to come along and tick the boxes every... So but I mean, often. I sort of grew up with sort of a geopolitical situation where there are big blocks of power who seemed to, one were aligned one way with the West one way and perhaps the East the other. We called it the Cold War. Yeah, yes. And that's kind of changed somewhat, I would have thought, the dynamics of it. it well, we're in a, we're in a uh, you might say, Cold War II. Yes. Just as we had okay. World War II. It, it's differently structured. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the players don't have the, the the players on both sides don't have the same internal uh, relationships as mm -hmm. they had before there isn't a soviet union and a soviet bloc mm -hmm. there isn't a warsaw pact uh, there is still nato but it is not the it's, same yeah. as, as as it was before uh, so, so the world changes and uh, we've got to move with that and it, 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 do you have a sense of optimism that there are institutions as in the one that you worked at you i am an optimist yes. uh, i'm an, in, inherently yeah. Yeah. an optimist so I always look to see the best we can achieve. It's not always what you would want to achieve, mm -hmm. but it's the best we can achieve. Well, of course, those of us in business have, have had this um, horror of seeing the trade agenda unravel, and luckily New Zealand has continued to drive ahead with the, tra the partnerships and ASIP and all of these things. Um, well, ASIP's on, the, on, on hold right now yeah, because, well, of, yeah. because of India. Yeah, but I mean, it's, there's hope. That, yes, that people, there is hope, and, and I have and hope. And our trade team, who I happen to rate very highly, continue to work re, you know, resolutely on, on, on the trade agenda. And I think New Zealanders are out there as champions for We trade. are very highly regarded as trade negotiators, yes. so much so that a number of people who've been trade negotiators for New Zealand mm. have been hired by the UK, <laughs> yes. which... Suddenly, after 40 years in the EU, when Brussels handled yeah. all trade negotiation, now has to do it itself, and it has got its no lost. No institutional years. knowledge. Yeah. yeah, it's a big, big issue. Uh, but I mean, we we uh, we hope, and I think the business community really hope that these um, wrestling elephants don't don't make life any more miserable for us than, than they might, um, because seriously, the trade war between China and the US has been disruptive. Yeah, it, it has, and uh, on the other hand. Yeah. Uh, you've probably got to say that Trump has done the right thing by mm. calling out China. I think everyone agrees with that. On yeah. some very unsatisfactory trade practices yes. that need to be addressed. And do you think he's made some progress in that? Very hard to tell because yeah. we don't see what the, the end result is. Um, mm. There are there are always hints of progress, mm. and then suddenly something sort of happens to to haul it back a bit. Mm. Uh, again, I'm an optimist, and I think it's in the interests of both Russia, China and the United mm. States to agree something. They're not going to do it easily. They're not going to give away the shop. Uh, they, uh, they know, however, that countries that trade together go, grow rich oh, yeah. together. And I think their soft diplomacy through their um, banking arrangements with the one Belt, one road, um, uh, you know, that seems to me not a bad idea. Well, the Belt and Road Initiative is, in yeah. fact, an interesting one because it's essentially focused on a region, region yeah. Asia, which has been very underdeveloped for infrastructure. Yeah. If you think we've got problems, look at uh, the Asian country. Uh, before we leave uh, uh, the UN, do you think that, um, from your experience in diplomacy, that uh, the diplomatic efforts that New Zealand has, the amount of money we have, is sufficient to actually achieve our diplomatic objectives? Never sufficient, usually enough. That's okay, the, so you don't, you don't, you don't you know, think we're the, horribly the, undershot? The, the, the public purse is not bottomless. Yeah. We could spend a lot of money on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I think that in the circumstances in which we find ourselves, we do a pretty good job with a, a, a an adequate but uh, not large budget. And an extremely hard-working public service to support Indeed, it. The, the, yeah. the, the, the people I've worked with are, are remarkably impressive. Mm. And they, they, among other things, managed to get a, a quart out of a pint pot. <laughs> um, but uh, circling back to issues that we face today, we have uh, protesters still sitting on the land at, at Amatau, at the, near the airport. 
Um, and, you know, I can see everyone's trying to dodge really dealing with what is, do we have to deal with it? Or, I mean, how does one resolve Well, you've stated these? the problem, really, uh, and, and why it's going to be so difficult to resolve. We, first of all, we can't reopen treaty settlements, yeah. and that seems to be one of the mantra that the government recites mm. very regularly on this issue. Uh, and we can't set precedents for the future. No. But on the other hand, uh, there is possibly here, and I don't know enough of the history, I must admit, oh. there is possibly here a genuine injustice that hasn't been fully addressed. And it doesn't, it doesn't, ma to, doesn't matter what structures you <laughs> had in place, the reality is that if there is an injustice, it will be a burr in the saddle, call it what you will, a stone in the shoe, yeah. uh, until it is resolved. So maybe this is an example of where we have to find an institutional way of dealing with it that enables us to do any others that may appear. But reopening uh, every but treaty I'm, settlement... I'm worried about precedent. Yeah, and I think most people are. Yeah, well, you've, you've given the same sort of answer others have. It's, 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 a, it's a very tricky one. To, to finish the interview on a perhaps a set of uh, uh, optimism, if, uh, if you were to give um, our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern some advice on what she might do to improve New Zealand in, should she have the privilege of serving as Prime Minister in the next round, what would, might be on that laundry list of things that she would address? Well, first of all, I, I, I wouldn't make it personal to the present Prime Minister yeah. or a, any particular yes. person who might be the future a future Prime Minister. First of all, I think you need to understand your country. You yes. need to understand it not just in terms of you know, people standing on the sideline uh, on a Saturday morning for rugby or soccer mm -hmm. uh, or, or netball. Uh, you, you need to understand the country and its history and how we came to be where we are today. The wars we fought, the um, economic changes we made, the innovations, the reforms we undertook, enfranchising women, um, mm -hmm. ombudsmen, the introduction of MMP, which I don't like particularly, <laughs> but, but these are all things that we have done and why we are where we are today. What, what was it that drove us yeah. to where we are today? You need to understand that. The other thing that I suppose I would advocate to any, any Prime Minister is then to reach down to, to the people who actually drive those things. Mm. And they're not parliamentarians. Yes, parliamentarians, mm pick up these issues and implement them, and some do it very, very skillfully. Uh, but the, the, the people who drive these things are out in the field, and not just NGOs, just individuals who have particular views about what they think their country should be doing and how it should be doing it. Those are sound advice. Hopefully it will be heeded. So Jim, thank you for your long career of public service, the enormous contribution you've made to the New Zealand discourse, and will continue to do, as uh, the years go by, because I know you're just as energetic today as you were 40 years ago. Thank you, uh, Sir Jim McClay, for being on Business at the Speed of Coffee. Thank you, Jim. Well, once again, thanks to Sir Jim McClay for being on our show today. But that's our show's last show for 2019. Business at the Speed of Coffee. 2019 has seen us talk to 21 exceptional and fascinating smart business people. If you have missed any of our episodes, Face TV will be repeating our shows throughout the summer. I'm Kim Campbell, and I hope you can join us once again in the new year. We'll see you all again in 2020.